Good morning, everybody. <laughs> uh, it's good to see everybody here, some familiar faces and new faces. Uh, my name is Neil Kelly. I am the former registrar of voters for Orange County, California. I retired. Uh, I'm not that aging demographic, by the way, that we <laughs> talked about. I'm not the <laughs> aging Yeah, exactly. Um, and I did that uh, for almost 17 years, fourth largest county in the United States, uh, just shy of 2 million voters. Um, so that was a, a long haul for me in, in that, that time period. I think election officials take the cue from Tom Brady when it comes to retiring or not retiring, because my alleged retirement uh, hasn't really started yet. I have been, well, in 22, I uh, helped the state of Hawaii through their elections during that uh, midterm cycle. And I've been the chairman of a committee called the Committee for Safe and Secure Elections. We're a cross-partisan group of former and current election officials and law enforcement designed to focus on the threats to election officials and the associated risks. So I've been doing that for the last uh, year as well. Uh, this distinguished panel we have this morning is here to talk about what election officials are saying. And they're saying a lot, as you can imagine, uh, especially as we lead into the 24 cycle. Some topics certainly will depend on what part of the country you're from uh, or what the topics are in your communities. Um, but there are universal topics as well. And we're gonna hear a little bit about that this morning as well. Topics can range, and I'm sure you have a nice list as well, but topics can range from voter registration growth, how to manage data, supply chain issues, which are gonna continue into 24, observers and transparency, physical and cybersecurity, paying attention to the stressors and mental health that election officials and their staff are going through, and partisan audits, I use air quotes on that, and investigations uh, that we will, I'm sure, see uh, through the 24 cycle. And the list goes on. Joining us today for this conversation are three distinguished individuals. Um, many of you know them, and I am honored to have known all three for a good majority of my career uh, and, and awesome people to work with. I'm going to introduce them briefly uh, and then give them about 10 minutes to talk about the topic, and then we'll jump into Q&A um, towards the end of that. I'll introduce uh, on my left, your right, uh, starting off with Amy Cohen. Amy is the Executive Director of the National Association of State Election Directors, uh, known as NASED. In that role, she represents all 50 states, D.C., and the five United States territories. NASA is the only national association just for state and territorial election officials. Uh, next to Amy is Paul Gronke. Professor Gronke is the founding director of the Elections and Voting Information Center, EVIC, or EVIC, I don't know what we should say, <laughs> and a professor of political science at Reed College in Oregon. He is a nationally known scholar of American politics, elections, and research methods. He is widely published with more than three dozen peer-reviewed articles, book chapters, and an academic book on a variety of topics related to election administration. And then joining us uh, on screen is Professor Charles, he was. <laughs> <laughs> joining us on screen is Professor Charles Stewart, uh, is the Keenan Sahin Distinguished Professor of Political Science at MIT and the founding director of the MIT Election Data and Science Lab. Hey, Charles, good to see you back there. So uh, first, actually, Charles, I'm going to turn it over to you first to, uh, is that if that's okay, to give us a, a, your take on what election officials are saying uh, and the topic at hand and uh, about 10 minutes worth. Thanks, Charles. Sure. And actually, I, I don't want to um, usurp the, the, the prerogative of the chair, but I'm wondering whether um, we want Amy and Paul to go first, given what I'm going to say. Charles, you forgot who's running this program here. I did. <laughs> like I said, I'm happy to go. I'm happy no, no. To go. Charles, that's, that's a great point. Uh, how about Amy? We'll start with you. Well, sure. After that, <laughs> how could I not? Um, so uh, as Neil mentioned, I'm the executive director of the National Association of State Election Directors, or NASED. And I do really want to thank um, Judd and the University of Minnesota and Humphrey School for having me uh, today. Um, before I sort of dive into what my members are saying, I'll sort of explain who my members are because not everyone, uh, it doesn't make sense to everyone. Um, so in the 40 states where a secretary of state or lieutenant governor serves as the chief election official, the member on my roster works for the chief election official. Um, so that includes Minnesota and uh, David Maida, the director of elections is here today. Um, 
In the other 10 states, D.C. and the five U.S. territories, NASA's member is the chief election official. And these are typically states that have the board, a board model. So the North Carolina State Board of Elections, because Tammy was using North Carolina uh, as an example. Um, but what that means is that I cover all 50 states, D.C. and the five U.S. territories. That's a lot of ground to cover, right? That's American, Samoa, and Guam to California and Texas, and quite literally everyone in between. And so I hear a lot from a lot of people um, all of the time. Um, NASA doesn't uh, do some of the things that Judd was talking about that some of the state associations do. Um, we don't take positions on issues. Um, we don't lobby um, and we really are an association that uh, supports our members by helping them share information across the states, helping the federal government share information more effectively with uh, the states and territories, something that has grown increasingly important uh, in the wake of the critical infrastructure designation in February 2017. Um, and we help our members connect with each other as sort of humans. Um, which is uh, candidly something I have really had to shift my brain to think about um, because I tend to think of election officials as uh, like election official robots um, and that that's all they focus on. And the fact of the matter is that's not all they focus on, right? They're all people. And so one of the things that we did um, during the pandemic was uh, we started doing weekly calls with our members um, to help them share information with each other, issues that were um, coming up in their states. So an example is, um, you know, if you, when, when uh, bars and restaurants were closed um, and people were getting unemployment for that, if those people served as poll workers, how did that impact their employment, unemployment uh, benefits? And, and how could we share information about things like that? Um, but it also really turned into supporting each other as people. Um, and helping everyone sort of cope through a presidential election, which is always really hard and is sort of a, a benchmark in our field of when people start thinking about retirement anyway. Um, but also there were humans who were also experiencing the COVID-19 pandemic, their families uh, were getting sick, you know, their kids were home from school. So helping people uh, in that way. Um, and we've continued doing some of that. Uh, we've we've shifted the calls to to biweekly, but we are continuing to sort of support um, our members in that way. And one of the things, um, a couple of the things that I want to emphasize are are things that came up um, on the previous panel, and I'm certain will continue to come up uh, over the course of today. Tammy said that people are exhausted, and that. I, I like I foot stomp. I I'm not, I don't work for the federal government, but uh, I would like to foot stomp that. Um, you know, in elections, we've always said there is no off year, um, and that has never been more true. Um, it did, however, used to be that it was a little bit slower in an odd year. Um, not every state has elections, um, but, you know, people had time to sort of regroup and pull themselves together and feel refreshed and energized um, going into an even year. Unfortunately, that's not where we are right now. And so people really are exhausted and burnout is a thing that is happening. Um, in addition to the fact that, as I mentioned, presidential election years tend to be benchmarks in our field when people uh, consider retirement anyway, because they are always very, very difficult. Um, Judd mentioned something really important and he, he talked about staff and the election staff in a local election office. And that is really true at the state level as well, but I wanna take that one step further. It's not just about election staff, election specific staff who are um, having a hard time wanting to stay in their role. Um, we're talking about the lawyers, we're talking about the communication staff, we're talking about the administrative staff. And that goes hand in hand with some of the threats and the harassment that people are seeing, whether or not it meets the definition of a crime. Um, you know, it's important. I, I do another presentation where I say all talking is communicating, and that sounds very basic, but it's an important thing to remember that anytime, uh, you know, an administrative assistant is picking up the phone and saying, hi, can I help you? In many places and, and sporadically, sometimes those people are dealing with vitriol on the other end. And it's not a crime to express an opinion uh, in that way, but it 
wears on you over time. The first one might be okay. The second one might be okay. But by the time you're answering your thousandth call where someone is calling you a traitor, that that weighs on you. Um, I also want to say, say the same thing about um, communication staff, because I think they bear the brunt of this as well when we're talking about social media and monitoring uh, office social media accounts and things like that. You know, the first comment calling your your boss or your chief election official a traitor, okay, you can maybe, you know, let that that roll off you, but the 500th or 1,000th, it, it starts to weigh on you. And so we are seeing a lot of turnover um, at the state level as well on the election side at the election director level, but also beneath that. Um, I have uh, members who it took them six months to hire an attorney because they needed an attorney for their office uh, to deal with the influx of open records requests. And that attorney gave notice after six months because it was like, this is this is too much. Um, and so a lot of the same issues that local election officials are dealing with are happening at the state level as well. Um, and states are having a very difficult time staffing up a lot of these positions. Um, I, I alluded to this, but the burden of false information is uh, something that I think needs to be addressed um, or, or at least mentioned because it permeates everything. A hundred percent of the, um, well, maybe that was going a little too far, especially as I'm on a panel with academics with actual numbers, but a lot of the, mm -hmm. a lot of the issues that um, state election officials are um, dealing with are exacerbated by uh, false information. So we're seeing, uh, you know, as I mentioned, threats and harassment directed at state election offices in a variety of different formats. Much of that is driven by false information. We're seeing a lot of legislation uh, that is in some places driven by false information. Um, and all of these things wear on you because, uh, you know, it's very difficult for an election office to first of all, have a loud enough voice that anyone will listen to them. I always say that election officials are never the loudest megaphone in the room, and that is a uh, hundred percent true. But it um, election officials have the sort of challenge where they can't they can't hang up the phone, right? You can't just say, i'm not we're not taking calls today or we're not answering questions. They're public servants. Um, and so they they have to step up. They have to answer questions. Um, and so that that can be very, very difficult, um, especially um, because it it is hard to um, argue or can you know you're not going to convince someone who who believes misinformation, um, you know, and you sort of have to suss out, are they uninformed? Are they misinformed? And how can we move forward on that? Um, and um, finally, I'll close with, um, one of the, I think, biggest shifts in the field that we've seen in the last couple of years is this difference between um, professional attacks, right? This office did something that I don't like. Um, we're going to pass legislation to change it, or we're going to, um, you know, try to influence policy in this way because this office did something we don't like, versus this person is the problem. And so it's the difference between the personal and the professional, and that makes people feel scared and feel vulnerable um, in a way that I uh, don't think that they did before. And it's also um, very difficult to prepare for that uh, and very difficult to hire into that because how do you hire people into an office where you might become a target for an innocent mistake or not a mistake at all? Um, and so that that is very challenging and has um, really shifted the um, the way I think uh, NASAD members and and state and territorial election offices are are thinking about some of these issues. I know that was like very gloom and doom, but I do want to say that one of the things I'm very proud of is this fact that NASAD has really worked hard over the last several years at building a community among our members so that they have a person in another state who really truly understands what they're going through because these jobs are so weird. It's very difficult to explain an election office job to someone who has never done it. Um, and so um, we worked really hard at building that community and it's something I'm very proud of. And I hope that, um, 
I hope it's paying off for my members. I get the sense that it is, um, but it's definitely something that we're planning to continue. Weird is an understatement. <laughs> <laughs> Amy, thank you for your work in this space and everything that you do. It's it's an, it's incredible uh, the work that you do. And also you've teed up some great stuff for the questions. So thank you. Professor Gronke. Uh, thank you, Neil. And thanks to um, the Humphrey School and Larry Jacobs, who I've known for uh, many years. You know, Judd mentioned at the beginning that, um, Judd Chod mentioned that election administration is kind of a sleepy backwater uh, in state and local government. And, and now it's not anymore. I, I will say, reflecting on this as a scholar, that it's also been something of a sleepy backwater in, in the academic sphere. Charles Stewart, who's here, um, myself, and we we leaned in as many scholars did after 2000, um, but unfortunately by 2004, 2005, a lot of those folks leaned somewhere else. Some of us are still in there swinging. Um, and I'm glad to see that I'm glad that the University of Minnesota has continued to support this program. It really is important that we have more scholarly attention here. So we begin to um, train students, expose new generations, um, begin to develop um, a, a new cadre of individuals. You know, some people are going to be retiring simply because it's time to retire, um, but we got to have somebody to replace them. Um, I also want to echo what um, Amy Cohen said about the human element of this. Um, uh, you're going to see in my slides some presentations, some surveys that we have been conducting um, through EVIC for the last four years. And when I initially started this project, one of the things I described was we want to do the human element, the human side of election administration. We don't want to replicate uh, the election administration and voting uh, survey, which is very important, which really sort of an accounting report. We want to allow election administrators to express their attitudes and opinions about election administration and really sort of a safe space with a confidential instrument. Um, and that, that was really valuable. We've learned so much. I, I, you know, I learn so much every day when I come to these kinds of things, communities, network supports. These are things we need to know a lot more about and really support um, amongst these communities. The earlier wave of work on election administration did reflect sort of how Amy described it as the election administrator is a cog in a system, um, but they're also human beings and the human element is really important. So can we um, get my deck up and let me see if I can advance this. Let's see if the range works here. I know it. Perfect. Thanks so much. So um, what I'm going to talk to you about today is really briefly um, in my 10 minute time, um, uh, review research um, primarily from uh, a 2022 uh, study survey that uh, we conducted at EVIC. I'm going to make some references to, um, okay, so that's good. That's back. So that's like about slide. Yeah, keep going backwards, backwards. Yep, backwards, backwards, backwards. I'm going the wrong way. Hold on. Ah, I see. Up is down. Excellent. Okay. Um, so we uh, have been serving election administration nationwide since 2018. Um, with my colleagues at EVIC, uh, Dr. Paul Manson, uh, Michelle Schaefer has provided us some support. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the results of that survey. I'm also going to try not to be completely doom and gloom, though, with Neil here and the sunny state of Hawaii. I figure we have to have a little darkness and clouds. You know, it's still winter in Portland, it feels like at times. Uh, so let me see if I got this, if this is working. Go, forward me. Go, just hit it forward. So I'm going to start a little bit um, with workforce and staffing challenges. And let me see if it'll advance. Good. So um, this is one thing that I have to show to every audience. I know many of the viewers um, online and folks in the audience will understand this, but really the diversity of, of the workforce and staffing challenges in offices is just really fundamental, um, that there are uh, dramatic differences across the largest jurisdictions in the United States. And of course, those small jurisdictions, most elected and typical election official in the United States serves at an office um, with two to three additional staff members surrounding them. Um, and, you know, they don't really have much support under COVID situations, other, other kinds of challenges, even challenges like sending someone off to training. They may not be able to do it because there's really nobody to cover. Um, as anyone who works in this space knows, um, 
recording has to go on every, you know, those property transactions have to be recorded. You can't just close the office on a Friday because somebody's coming in to close property. Uh, so that's really important to understand as we think about supporting this community and advancing the community, we have to support those mid-sized and smaller size jurisdictions that um, are facing real staffing challenges. Um, so this is a stylized uh, chart uh, that others in the room may want to uh, st throw stones at us. But what we tried to do here is in, in um, parallel with the report that we're working on um, supporting the uh, uh, with the support of the state of Oregon is we tried to capture the ebb and flow of, of the work um, that election administrators describes to us. Um, and what became clear to us in our interviews was um, that the peak capacity is beyond their capacity. Um, that if that, you know, the, the, the line that we drew, kind of the A, you know, the B line at the bottom is kind of the normal workflow, um, at least in the state of Oregon, I expect another vote by mail states, there is a peak that occurs in the kind of ballot preparation period that really expands that you have to proof these ballots, you have to get them out, you have to get them printed in return. And that often we find um, officials telling us this is now, this is not a month before the election. This is six to nine months before the election. And they tell us that they're beyond the capacity of their normal workforce. And this is not a period where they're going to be bringing in temp staff normally, right? This is, you know, this is January and February of a normal election year. Then there's some downtime, but then there's that flow that comes in again and really expands. And we'll have officials telling us um, you know, that they are working well beyond the normal capacity of their office. They're coming in uh, on the weekends. They're coming in after hours. Um, and so um, we have some officials telling us these things in our interviews um, that, you know, a vacation, uh, they don't uh, take vacations, um, that they're constantly working, that if they take a vacation, the stress of simply taking some time off um, is worse than just continuing to work. Um, you know, we have parents telling us that, um, and primarily this is a 75% uh, female staffed profession telling us, um, I'm a mom, except during the election year when somebody else is a mom. And these are, you know, these are hard things to hear from officials as they're describing this environment to us. Um, the, the new environment uh, that has emerged over the last five or six years, um, the threats, harassments, and the flood of public records requests, we've also heard this from um, our respondents. So uh, Tammy Patrick helpfully showed you this slide. So if you did see here it is again. Um, the one addition I have um, to the uh, part that, uh, I'm sorry, it's a retirement one that's coming up. So this is, um, uh, officials told us in, 20, uh, in 2022, one in four told us that they had experienced some level of harassment. And, you know, there's not a lot of bipartisanship in uh, today's political environment, but this is one area that we can get agreement on. Republicans, Democrats, females, males, large jurisdictions, small jurisdictions, they all get threats and harassments. Now, there are some patterns that we can extract from the data. There seems to be more um, threats and harassments in Republican-leaning areas and in larger jurisdictions. But in general, this is endemic in the community and it's experienced. And it's not, as Amy said, it's not just the directors that are experiencing this. It's folks in their day-to-day -day lives. In some of our personal interviews, people say, well, I don't share what I do about my job anymore because I don't know what I'm going to encounter in the grocery store or in a tavern. Um, so again, um, uh, folks will tell us that this, uh, the threats and harassments is seriously distracting from their ability to do their job, um, that the constant efforts to counter misinformation, um, it, it, you know, that somebody heard something somewhere is uh, distracting from their ability to do their work. Um, I'm sorry for some of these uh, quotes that are coming up. Um, we have officials telling us about they've had to learn how to do active shooter training on top of learning how to manage viruses, on top of learning how to do LinkedIn or to do TikTok videos, that um, it, it's sort of hard to keep up. And um, we were talking about this last night at dinner. Uh, some of these offices are in locations where they weren't set up to have two exits and bulletproof glass that, you know, they're not set up for that. Um, and again, this is just has just been layered on as a new layer uh, area of expertise that officials have had to to master. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of the good, um, and then go into bad and the ugly. On the ugly, you'll see Tammy's uh, slide uh, picture again. Um, we do see high levels of job satisfaction. This has been quite consistent across our surveys from 2018 up to 2022. Some erosions after 2020, uh, but generally three quarters to 80, 85% of officials tell us they do enjoy their jobs. Uh, they do have a sense of personal accomplishment. You've heard this if you talk with officials, this kind of active day-to-day -day element of this work, um, they really find rewarding. Uh, 
Customer service orientation um, it has been embraced in the profession. I, I think we, we haven't been measuring this back to the 2000s, but I do think the uh, the PCA and other uh, many folks in this room who I've worked with um, for 10 or 15 years, some of them, I think this has been a change in the profession, this sort of embrace, embracing uh, professionalism, just really kind of openly. You know, when Tammy was describing, I, I quickly went on the LinkedIn and I searched for the number of officials who listed CIRA. Top of the list was Tammy Patrick, Dina Dawson, who might be listening, Denver County, there it is, Sierra. Jay Hatfield in Shawnee County, Kansas, there right there is Sierra. I will say to uh, Tammy that there's about 50 out there that mention the full certificate name. Um, I do think that it, it would be encouraging, and I encourage her to try to, uh, as her graduates and others, mention Sierra up there, right up on the name. Don't mention it down in the certificate the category of uh, LinkedIn, but put it right up there, uh, just like PhD. Uh, Michelle Schaefer, I work with, you know, uh, 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 Professors are often a bit embarrassed to put PhD after their names, and and, and Michelle's like, no, uh, you got to put PhD out there. That sends something to the community at, outside of academia to put that PhD. In. Same with CIRA. It describes that kind of certification. It becomes a, an acknowledgement of the expertise that you gain. Um, the bad, um, well, one of the bads that we hear a lot, we've heard this quite consistently, is that um, legislators, uh, maybe election directors in Colorado, no, not there. Change is really fast. Um, it changes occurring quickly, and at least um, when we ask um, election officials, local officials, about whether some of these legislative changes are helpful, um, the majority say they're not. Um, change is occurring very quickly. Often these changes are not funded, um, so there are new mandates um, without uh, the money to hear. So election uh, officials tell us that quite consistently. Uh, the, you saw this from Tammy already. Workloads are increasing across the board. They're stretching the capacity. We have far too many officials telling us that they um, are considering retirements, and these retirements are accelerating. There's a, a great loss of expertise and institutional knowledge in the field. Um, so I do want to uh, close by uh, just briefly reviewing where we've been and give you a tool uh, to look at some of these data on your own. Um, so... There we go. So um, the work here was supported uh, with a partnership and collaboration with Democracy Fund um, for its first four years. We have um, evolved and developed the survey to adapt to what we view and what we hear from audiences like this about the current needs of the community. Our uh, election year surveys tend to focus on readiness. Um, obviously, in 2020, for example, we did a deep dive into uh, COVID preparations and how that impacted. In the off years, we have tended to focus on um, workforce issues, staffing, um, uh, uh, retirement, succession planning, these kinds of things. I will say in 2023, we are focusing on what we will call resilience. Um, uh, we're doing deep dives in the instrument. On, uh, we are now being supported by the MIT um, Election Data Science Lab. Thank you, Charles, for that support. I mean, we're looking at recruitment, training, um, and, and workforce issues. As I mentioned already, we are in the final stage of um, an interview project that we've done with the support of the state of Oregon. There'll be, um, we may be able to be presenting that in some summer conferences, um, but we're really excited about that work. Many of the quotes you've seen here have come directly from that uh, project. Um, this is where our website is, evic.read.edu. And what I wanna show you here is the survey. You may not be able to see that well, but um, this is from that page. And we have the uh, descriptive statistics in the code book from each year of our survey. Now you can navigate through. So for example, Amy can't see this in the back of the room. So we have evaluations of state associations. There's a whole series of those. So um, you could do a deep dive into that. I know I'll show you that later, um, but it's fairly easy to navigate. We have these data uh, publicly broken down by jurisdiction size. We can do some additional analyses if you reach out to us, but that we're trying to make the data as available as we can while maintaining the confidentiality, confidentiality of, our, of our respondent pool. Um, so this is our uh, website and my contact information, uh, my colleagues at EVIC, if you have any more questions, I want to do any follow-ups, uh, we welcome hearing from you. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you for everything that you do in the industry as well. You know, you were talking about the job satisfaction surveys, and I, it struck me that I, I recalled your surveys coming in a little bit after the, the certification of the election. And it made me think of an interview with Steven Spielberg one time when he said, after a movie wraps, he never wants to make another movie ever again. <laughs> I feel kind of the same way with elections a little bit. Um, and after you get away from the pain of that, then the job satisfaction creeps back in. So um, thank you again. Professor Stewart. 
Excuse me. Um, thanks, Neil, and um, thanks to the Humphrey School for sponsoring this and for everybody on the call um, today. I'm sorry I can't be there. I'm um, unlike Professor Gronke, apparently, um, I teach students. Um, and <laughs> I have a class um, um, right after this seminar. Otherwise, I would love to be there. Um, in part, I mean, for um, for reasons that have been touched on by both Amy and Paul, that um, you know, this really is a community, and it's a rich community and a growing rich community of election officials supporting each other. But it's also a larger ecosystem of um, um, of people who see themselves as helping election officials and working with election officials. And over the last 20 years, that community has grown as well. And whenever I can be with election officials and people who support them, um, that's my happy space. And so um, I would rather be in Minnesota than um, in the seminar room. And I'm, and I'm sorry I can't be there um, um, today. So um, what I'm going to um, talk about, and I'm going to, um, I hope I'll be able to share my screen in just a second, um, is, um, is different from what um, Amy and Paul have talked about. I'm going to turn the lens around of the camera. Um, and so Amy and Paul have, from their experience, been able to talk compellingly about the experience of state, of, state officials and local election officials, um, both over time and in the particular moment. My research and my, um, my public opinion research has focused on what voters have to say about the experience and um, their experience of voting. And so that's gonna be the lens that I use um, for these remarks here is to talk from a survey that I've been conducting since the 2008 election called the Survey of the Performance of, of American Elections. Um, this is a survey that goes out to 200 um, 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 registered voters in every state plus the District of Columbia. And um, we ask them about their experience voting and a lot of other opinions they might have about um, the experience as well. It got started in the aughts um, because there was, during the time, and folks on the call, if you're old enough, you will remember that in the view of many voters, um, the United States wasn't a whole lot different from a banana republic. Um, a lot of it, what was in the news really focused on the, the negative experiences that voters were having. And part of that came out of the Florida recount and all of that. But um, the press and others were primed to really focus on um, the negative. And my colleagues and I thought that, well, you know, there are things in the election space that certainly could be improved. But un unless we talk to voters about their, their experience, we really don't know how widespread um, problems are. And so it's important to talk to them. So in the same way that, that Paul has been talking to election officials, we've been talking to voters about their experience um, for the past um, now decade and a half. So we have, um, we were able to do this survey um, right after the um, 2022 election. Um, we have been able to do every presidential election from 8, 12, 16, and 20, and then also the midterm of 2014. So we can talk about how things have gone over, over, the, over, this, over this time period. Um, what I'm gonna talk about today is um, kind of set some of the context a kind of the voter context for um, some of the topics that have been talked about talked about today. So with, with that bit of throat clearing, let me see if I can share my screen. I hope I'm shared. Um, if not, some, I, I can, it looks like my screen's behind um, Neil there. So I will, um, I will move, move ahead. So I'm gonna talk about um, three topics that um, I think are relevant to this larger discussion that are covered in, in the survey. First of all, just about the voter experience in 2022. Secondly, touch on issues of voter confidence. And then finally, just say a very brief word about um, how voters are seeing some of the efforts that um, local and state election officials are undertaking in order to secure elections. Um, in this um, in, in this time. So just um, about the voter experience. Since 2008, we've been asking um, people who voted on election day 
um, four core questions about their experience um, on that day. Um, and these come out from those sorts of problems that were commonly reported in the aughts and have continued to be commonly reported since then. Did you have a problem um, with your registration when you went to vote? Did you encounter any problems with the voting equipment? Um, what about the polling place? Was it well run? And um, what about the poll workers? Um, how well did they perform their, their job? And in 2022, just as in every other year, we see that respondents overwhelmingly say they didn't have problems with registration, they didn't have problems with the voting machines. Um, things were run either very well or okay in their polling place. And the job performance, 95% of voters said the job performance of the poll workers was either excellent or good. So th this is not an electorate that is, this is not an electorate voting in, in, a, in, a, in a banana republic. This is not an electorate that is having a bad experience when they go to vote on election day. Um, same sorts of answers um, come from people who voted by mail. Um, we ask if they had problems getting their ballot, problems marking the ballot, problems following the instructions on the ballot. And um, again, overwhelmingly, voters report ease in getting the ballot, marking the ballot. And um, most say that the instructions were very easy um, to follow, either very easy or, or somewhat easy to follow. Um, all of this comes together when we ask voters their overall um, trust and whether their vote was um, counted as they intended. This is the question that we've asked similar to questions that are asked by other pollsters. Um, um, regardless of how you ex ask the question exactly, you get the same general answers. And in 2022, when we asked um, people if they were confident that their vote was counted as they intended, um, election day, early voting, and mail um, um, voting voters all overwhelmingly said that they were either very confident or somewhat confident that their, their, vote, um, their vote was counted. So the actual experience of voters, and I think this is important to, to you know, to, as we try to understand the larger context in which election officials are having, um, you know, are facing real challenges from certain segments of society, that when we think about the blocking and tackling, the everyday work of election officials, their customers, if you will, um, continue to notice that the elections are being um, um, pulled off um, really, really well and at a high degree of excellence. And um, but let's turn our attention and and and, and just um, um, say a few more things about voter confidence in general. In 2022, um, we asked, as we have in these other years, how confident are you that not only was your vote counted as intended but votes in your county or city, in your state, or votes nationwide. And as this, um, as this graph indicates, that the further away from the voter one gets, um, the less confident voters are overall about the conduct of the election. Although even nationwide, which is the most um, remo removed from voters, still um, almost 70% of voters in 2022 said that they were either very or somewhat confident that votes nationwide were counted as they were intended. Now, we all know that there's been a, a growing partisan divide in, um, in, in answers about voter confidence. Um, one of the things I should note is that this divide, while it is, has grown a little bit in recent years, at the local level, when we look at Democrats and Republicans and how confident they are in um, local election administration, we see what is known in political science and has been known for decades is the winner and loser effect, that when your party wins, you tend to you know, think better of the process than when your party loses. Nonetheless, in recent years, as um, you know, Republicans, for instance, have lost, um, you know, say, the 2020 election, um, the degree of dissatisfaction among Republicans um, basically dropped back down to where it had been in 2012, the last time a Republican presidential candidate had lost. So these gaps, um, these partisan gaps at the local level are um, kind of within scope of what we've seen in the recent past 
in prior elections before we were worried, for instance, about election denialism. However, when we get further and further away from the voters' experience and voters are listening to not their own experience, but that of neighbors or the media or you know, you know, um, political candidates through the media, we see even great, we see increasingly great divides. Um, when we ask people about, for instance, do they trust elections in their state? A big divide. And then when um, we ask, um, do you trust elections nationwide? The election nationwide. Um, there was about a 50 point gap in 2020 in the partisan gap over, over trust in the election outcome. That 50 point gap, by the way, being a narrowing of the gap from what it was in 2020. Okay, so um, to return to the state level um, trust, one of, the, one of the important things to understand about trust of the voters in the process is um, to return back to this kind of winner and loser effect. Um, if we had looked state by state in 2016, um, we would have seen that in red states, Republicans were happier than Democrats. In blue states, Democrats were happier in, than Republicans. In purple states, it was kind of a mix. And that's what this graph shows. It's a hard graph to read. The important thing to note, what this graph shows is for every state, um, the blue dot is um, how confident Democrats were about elections in the state, and the red dot is how confident Republicans were. So this is 2016. The states at the top where Republicans are more confident are, are the red states. States at the bottom where the Democrats are more confident are the blue states. Okay. 2020 was different from anything that we, I've ever seen, in which everywhere um, Democrats were more confident on than, than Republicans, and oftentimes by a big margin. And where was the gap um, the widest? Well, the gap was at the bottom of this graph, and the states at the bottom of the graph were, first of all, battleground states where Donald Trump lost narrowly, like Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and states that had all male elections. Um, and you put these two things together, the all you know, kind of all male elections plus Donald Trump losing was really kind of a toxic mix in 2020. In 2022, the gap has has shrunk in most states. So this partisan gap has shrunk in most states, with a couple of exceptions. And um, these are very important exceptions and help us to focus on where things may be worse for election officials than in other, some other states. For instance, there are still some of the battleground states that were barely lost by Donald Trump. Pennsylvania and Arizona particularly stand out in this regard. Um, and still uh, in states with all male elections, there still is this big divide. Now, one of the things I just wanna stop here in, in, in talking about, about um, voter confidence, given the, given the um, challenges that election officials are facing these, these days, and, but also given the, the kind of the, the politics around election reform um, in the states, oftentimes there's, there, there's a focus on this issue of trust and levels of trust. While overall trust in elections is down in 2022 and 2020 than say in 2016, um, and there is a, a, a gap um, between the parties, the gap is not out of scope in terms of what we've seen historically. So the issue is, is the, the issue in terms of the nastiness that election officials are living through is not so much, and this might be splitting here, hairs, but I think it's an important thing um, that we see in the, in the public opinion um, work that we and other people have done, that the issue is not so much a matter of trust, but it's a matter of two other things. One is anger over results. And secondly, the creation of, of organizations that are grifting off the distrust. Um, if it were simply a matter of distrust, eventually, probably, things would equilibrate back. But now we have a different thing. And that is we have people in civil society who are not only fomenting distrust, but finding people who are particularly angry about elections are 
going out in the hustings or having seminars where they're convincing people that they should be angry and that they should act on that anger. And by the way, buy my pillow or my book out in the lobby. Um, so that's a that's one of the ways in which um, the environment, the public opinion of environment has really changed. Now, um, I will end by kind of shifting and note that, you know, election officials uh, are dealing with a lot. And um, we've talked about not only what they're dealing with so far in these two sessions, but but their, their reactions to the, um, you know, the general um, um, the kind of public opinion um, setting. One of the things that hasn't been talked about so much um, today, but I know is going to be talked about later on, is what election officials are doing to, um, you know, demonstrate to the public that they are, in fact, securing elections um, and making them secure and trustworthy. For the first time in 2022, we asked respondents to the SPAE whether they knew about various very common activities that election officials undertake in order to make elections more trustworthy, ranging from logic and accuracy testing, nonpartisan poll workers, to wargaming out um, and tabletop exercises um, dealing with cyber threats. One of the things we discovered in the survey is that voters actually don't know <laughs> about these things. Um, about 40% of voters say they, they claim they know, and there are reasons actually to doubt whether they really know, but 40 only 40% claim they know that election officials conduct logic and accuracy testing. And that is the most common thing that they claim they know. All these other things, like making sure there's a chain of custody for ballots, having nonpartisan and partisan poll work watchers, um, pro prosecuting fraud, election fraud. These are things that voters don't know about. However, when we ask them what would increase, which of these would increase um, your confidence in election outcomes, um, all of them would increase um, um, confidence, but particularly the most common of the activities like logic and accuracy testing and um, securing paper ballots, et cetera. Um, so, um, so here's, I, I would say, a, a piece of good news, um, another piece of good news from the public opinion work in the SPAE. Not only are, are election officials, or rather voters, confident that their vote was counted, um, confident in elections as they observe them, that they are ripe for learning about what election officials are doing systematically to make sure that the, the system is secure. Um, and on that, I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I will end there and um, yeah, I'll end there and I'm happy to um, engage in the Q&A and discussion. That was the cue, Charles. <laughs> that was Neil. Thank you. Uh, Charles, thank you so much. I had the honor of serving with Charles for nearly a year on the National Academy of Sciences Voting Committee and have learned so much from you throughout the years. So thank you so much. We have a ton of good questions and I was told I could eat a little bit into the break don't shoot the messenger, um, but we'll do that uh, because I think these are excellent questions to get to. And before we get to some individual questions, I have a question for all of you. Uh, and that is based on what you've said or what you've heard your colleagues say this morning, what items or item would you prioritize that we should focus our attention on and why? And I'd love to start with Amy and we'll go to Paul and then Charles. So I don't know exactly who we is in this scenario, but I will say, False, false information for me is the, the top issue because we're seeing it permeate literally everything, right? We see that in the results of Paul's survey. We see that in the results of Charles's survey. And it is sort of an intractable problem because, you know, I said election officials don't have the loudest megaphone. I think you see that very, very clearly in the last slide that Charles showed before he um, caused me to leap out of my skin. <laughs> um, and, um, you know, election officials are doing what they can to message a lot of this stuff and to dem uh, to promote themselves as experts and their offices as the source for accurate, reliable, trustworthy information about elections. 
but no one is listening to us. No one, no one is listening. And that is a very difficult uh, problem to solve. Um, and so if anyone has ideas, I think we're all sort of open to that. But for me, that that is just the absolute number one challenge um, because it is impacting the way voters experience elections and think about elections. And it is impacting the way election officials uh, experience their jobs and administer their jobs and the policy frameworks that surround them. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. And the clarification of we is the election community. So that, that's my thought there. Paul. Well, that's good, Neil. I was going to give a two-part answer. So on the, I'll give, uh, I'll speak to my own community, frankly. Um, this is happening, I think, election administration and the scholarly work needs to penetrate more deeply across different disciplines. Um, it primarily has a presence in political science, it, it, some in public administration, but it needs to appear in the computer science textbooks and the stats books, Charles and I others, we need to do that hard work um, so that uh, students are just exposed to uh, this area of study. Um, you open up a computer science or stats book and you'll find lots of examples and election examples aren't there yet and we need to mainstream this work just so people see it. Um, related to that, I guess we'd say on the work that we've been doing, I, I think one of the um, uh, areas where work can be done is, I guess I would say at the mid-level hiring area, what we found in our work in Oregon, as well as um, I expect we're going to learn, we're going to be asking the survey in the next month, is that if folks don't know what the benefits are of working in this space, they only know what the negatives are. And what we found, for example, in Oregon is that literally the benefits, meaning the non-salary benefits, young folks just don't know that. And to the degree that, that the positive aspects of the job can be conveyed, the excitement that the change is a good thing, the kind of just the engagement with the community, I think, um, you know, we have to get, we have to um, make sure that people see this as an attractive um, career. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Charles. Thanks. I, 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 I um, support what my, my two colleagues have said. I guess... Um, in terms of prioritizing, um, I would, my sense right now, um, I, I totally, I, I, uh, what Amy said um, at, at the beginning of her answer about mis and disinformation as being kind of the big thing. Um, I hear that a lot and I, I believe it, it's true. I mean, it, it is totally true. The, the, the challenge is that we don't know what works, if anything. And in fact, I think I'm coming to the view as I read the, the, politi the political science and communications work, not only in elections, but in other areas that share with elections and public health and public safety um, and climate change. There's, it's not just elections where um, minds are hard to change. And intuitive strategies to try to deal with that sometimes, oftentimes backfire. And so one, prior, one priority is just to understand what we need to be doing and, and get better at it. Having said, and, and um, the, the priority then becomes what we do know is that um, a bad election, those few voters who have a bad experience don't trust elections. Those one, two, three, four percent don't trust elections. And so I would come around. I know it's hard. I know it's demoralizing um, um, to be uh, under the assault right now um, in many places. Um, but what election officials have under their control of, more often than not is how well the election is run. And the blocking and tackling of elections is the one thing that election officials are good at doing. And getting better at doing that is something under the control of election officials. And so, um, so I, would, I would encourage continuing to prioritize running really good elections. And let's figure out together um, how we get this communications thing down. Excellent responses from all three. Thank you. We're going to end here with a, just a dip into the break with a question for each of you. 
and I'll start off with Amy. Uh, we don't talk enough, I think, about mental health in this country for a variety of reasons. Um, unfairly, the stigma, I think, associated with that. You talked about the exhaust that your members are feeling, being exhausted. What are members saying about their mental health, or I'll use the term from Tammy, their soul? I'm glad you asked because I really liked the way Tammy phrased that, and I guess uh, Weber County <laughs> phrased that. Um, here's here's what I'll say. In 2021, at uh, one of our virtual conferences, we did a session on mental health, um, and I invited a, um, a psychiatrist from the Defense Health Agency, so from the federal government, works with the Department of Defense, and I was very nervous about this. I said at the beginning, I tend to think of my members as elections robots, um, and so uh, I tend to think of myself as an elections robot also, and so thinking about mental health in a professional context was very strange for me. And so I was really nervous about how it was going to go. And within 10 minutes, I was getting texts and, and messages from my members about how this was the, the best thing at the entire conference, um, because this is a huge issue. Um, and I know that that gentleman is not his job, but they he went like around the country <laughs> doing this. Um, so we are seeing more prioritizing, I think, of mental health in election offices because people are realizing more what it means. That doesn't always translate into direct action because I think people don't know how to support their colleagues through some of this stuff. Um, they don't know how to support themselves through some of this stuff. And it is a place where I think that professional associations uh, can play a role, um, is helping to bring these resources to um, election officials because it's not just about um, what an individual is experiencing, it's helping manage staff who are experiencing problems. Um, and uh, the, the gentleman we brought in from the Defense Health Agency was, he talked about, we're not alone, Charles references also, you know, we're not alone, this happens a lot in a lot of other fields, but it's about sort of getting back on the field and continuing to play because election officials don't have the opportunity or the option if we're gonna stay in this field we don't have the option to sit out an election and there are elections every Tuesday. Um, so I think we're seeing more people prioritize it, but figuring out what prioritizing means and how to put that into action uh, is a challenge. And frankly, I think a place where associations can play a pretty significant role. Awesome, thank you, Amy. Paul, great um, kudos to you and your team for the work you're doing on the satisfaction surveys uh, and all the data around that. And you made a point earlier about young people looking at this profession and how do we attract them into this industry? And so one question came in, which I thought was great, is how does job satisfaction compare to past years? And is there a trend line that you're seeing within those satisfactions? Yeah, um, not great. There's some erosion. We have a, 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 a series, my colleague Paul Manson, who um, has a public administration degree, adapted a set of workforce um, job satisfaction questions that we've um, put into the instrument, as well as an overall. Many have heard me present on these data before. Uh, election uh, election officials are frustrating um, because you get them um, aside in a room or, or as Amy said, in, in small group settings, um, which actually we're, we're doing more of that kind of work, Neil, because it really is valuable and the officials will open up in a way that um, oddly enough, they won't in a confidential survey instrument, but um, I, I call it the stiff upper lip um, sort of responses. Yes, yes, we can do it. Um, we can get it done. Um, they, they will not uh, describe to us pain points. So we're trying to ask the questions in different ways. So officials will, will tell us. So overall job satisfaction remains high, but for example, the number of percentage who will say that they would encourage their child to go into the profession, which is one of those sneaky little questions. Um, has has declined. Um, and so there there are uh, the number of people who are willing to report pain points, stressors, um, other difficulties in the profession um, has increased. Um, we've also been tracking uh, the hours and just to work, and that's been increasing as well. The number of officials just say, you know, the work. So we're, we're seeing cracks in the armor, and you're a tough armored profession, believe me, folks. This is a tough armored profession. 
um, but we've got to figure out where those cracks are so that so that we can help out. Excellent insight. Thank you, Paul. Charles, you're going to have the last word with the, the last question, two-part question. Um, and, and kudos again to you for the survey work that you do. I, I don't know an election official in the country that doesn't use it at some point um, throughout their career. How did you decide on 200 surveys is part one? And are there efforts to expand or any interest in expanding the survey size? Yeah, I mean, wow, very, very geeky quick, um, questions. I'm more, more than happy to um, um, email with whoever, um, um, whoever asked the question, cstewart at mit.edu. Um, 200 was chosen so that it, it was a, it, it's kind of the right size that if you do have big effects across states that you can actually measure them. So, um, and then when you uh, roll up from, you know, 200, you have 10,000, 200 per state plus DC, you have 10,200 which ends up being a, a really large and therefore expensive survey. So the number was trading off um, sample size and cost of doing, doing the survey. 200 is a good number. Um, if there's a big difference between states, um, and that was what was, um, uh, what was driving it. Um, if someone um, wants to um, give me more money for bigger samples, I will do that. In 2020, in fact, I did. Um, where we had um, sample sizes of a thousand in nine of the battleground states. Um, so um, sixteen dollars, sixteen dollars an, an interview. Um, you know the price. Yeah, excellent. Uh, sorry, we, we couldn't get to all the questions. We had some great ones coming in, and I do want to extend my thanks to Amy, Paul, and Charles for your excellent insights and a debt of gratitude to Larry and Judd and the Humphrey School for all the work that you're doing in this amazing conference. Uh, thank you again, and be back at the top of the hour, 12 Central, 1 Eastern, 10 Pacific, or excuse me, 11 Pacific, no, 10 Pacific. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>